Thank you, JP. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to just want to take just a one last moment and uh, introduce to you uh, a man who is after God's own heart, a guy who's constantly encouraging me and Shannon in the ministry and in our personal lives. And uh, I want to just take and introduce Pastor Travis and Sunshine. Uh, they serve here as associate pastors, and he's our director of our student ministries. Uh, they have they have been serving in full time ministry since August of 2000. So been at it for a little while. Been at it for a little while. It's a lot of wisdom, knowledge, experience that comes with that. So they both attended Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, where Travis earned his Bachelor's of Science in Pastoral Ministry in 2004. Man, you've been such a help to me in my ministry. You know, I, I, I cannot do this without you. And I'm sure that Seth and Jesse would agree that they can't do what they do without you, man. You're just such a blessing to this church, to this body. And uh, we just honor you and, and Sunshine and what you're doing here. Come on, can we just give them some, some, some show them some honor right now? Yeah. <laughs> so they have, uh, they have served here at First Assembly since 2013 with their children, Eternity, Serenity, Kalel, Jubilee, Angeli, and Evangeline. And we'll find out in a month or so. <laughs> So together, uh, pastors Travis and Sunshine counted a great honor to minister to students and families while encouraging them to pursue a deeper relationship with Christ. So could you help me this morning as we just welcome Pastor Travis uh, to come and, and minister? So... Uh... Wanted to clarify a little bit with our fine arts students to so those of you that are sitting out there as students and you think maybe I can't compete at the national level, maybe I just don't uh, meet the mark. Uh, Eternity and her graphic design received 10th place in the country and Weston got 6th place on his photography. So we don't only just have gifted students here, we have like national level gifted students and I believe that they're not the only two. Uh, so really encourage your children, grandchildren to get involved in that. I know for me, uh, my youth pastor called me out when I felt a call to ministry in camp. At camp, he said, well, what are you doing for fine arts this year? I said, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to do fine arts because I don't want to be up in front of people on a stage. And he said, but God called you to preach, and so I'm not really giving you an option. You're going to preach five-minute sermon, and so I did it. And I got to go to nationals. I did not get a superior, uh, but I preached at nationals, and it encouraged me in some of the comments that I got showing me that I can do what God had called me to do. And so it's not like uh, JP said, it's not about being the best, but it's about taking what God's given you and allowing him to develop that in you so that you can move into that realm. And so this morning, as I was preparing the message, it actually came while we were sitting in the celebration service at National Fine Arts, and the celebration service is my favorite part of the whole festival because, like JP said, there's about 20,000 students that come from around the country to preach and teach and, and do children's lessons and drama and art and photography and all these things, and they even have a program called Capital for the college students so that once you graduate, you don't have to stop. You can continue to develop your talents and abilities, and we're setting that service and uh, I, for the first time in a church service, I had heard the word squish because there were so many people there. They said, you got to squish together. And I was like, that's weird. Um, just say scoot over. But uh, he, he had them all squish together because I think there's about 30,000 people in this auditorium. Very, very big. Very, 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 very loud. Um, and, and so we, we were sitting there and they would read off, you know, like an awards ceremony. It's like, uh, you know, whatever. I don't watch award ceremonies. The Academy Awards or something like that. And they'd say, in the category of Short Sermon Junior, and they'd have like the drum roll and everything. And on the, on the screen behind them, they'd throw up the top three in the country. And so you hear cheers from around the room, Texas, Florida, Texas, Florida, Texas, Florida. Soon it's going to be Louisiana, 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 Louisiana. But they can have their moment. They can have their moment. We're taking it back. And, uh, and so they would call them up, and then, and then there would be special categories that they, they thought really, really, really did an excellent job, and they wanted to showcase them. And so these students, in front of 30,000 people, get the opportunity to come up on the stage and present. And I'm telling you, when, 
when we had a 12-year-old girl come up and lead worship, <laughs> I mean, if you can't get there, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but she, she was amazing. But the thing that really touched me was the Capital. They had a human video. And if you're not familiar with human videos, they come up and they, they act out just motions, no costumes, no props. They act out scenes with some music and some, some speaking on it. And they were talking about it. And what they talked about kind of encouraged me and, and, and planted a seed in me for this morning. So I'm really excited to have the opportunity to be able to come and share with you all uh, this morning. And, uh, you know, parents, be sure to be excited about stuff like this. Because I can tell you, what I get excited about, my kids get excited about. And if I'm not excited about it, they're not excited about it. In fact, my, my opening story this morning, I was thinking about my dad as a kid and, and wanting to be like dad. I think most sons look at their dad and they see things that he does, and he does these great, amazing, powerful things because you're just little, and he's like Superman. Because he can like pick up a whole gallon of milk without any help. It's amazing. <laughs> It's like I'm like struggling, but he can like do it like with one finger sometimes. Just oh, look at that, son. And I'm like, this guy, he can probably fly, right? And so dad, you know, back in the day, he had, he had those glasses from like the 70s. You guys remember those? Like the lenses were about this big around, the real thin uh, rims, they were gold, and they were transition lenses, right? Like they were, I mean, it was all the rage. It was exciting. It amazed me every time dad walked out of the house. Again, superpowers. And it was like sunglasses. I'm like, this guy, this guy's something. And as a little kid, I wanted to be like dad. In fact, I see some of our younger people. Uh, I'm not a young person anymore, but some of our younger people, they're wearing glasses, and they look just like my dad's glasses. It's like they came all the way around here we are, almost 2020, and they're back. They're in style. Dad should have kept them in the drawer. He could pop them on and be the coolest grandpa in the whole land. But I remember he had his drawer. Dad had his junk drawer. It had all kinds of stuff in it, papers, pens, trash, gum, batteries, and he kept his glasses in there. Now, mind you, he didn't put them in a the case. He just sunk them in there, and he had his glasses. And, and so I wanted to be like Dad, and I thought maybe... Maybe these glasses had some special powers to them. Maybe if I put these glasses on, I could do like what dad does. And so I pulled those glasses out and I put them on my face and my eyes went crossed. And I was like, I don't know what, I don't know what these glasses are, dad, but you need to stop wearing them. They hurt my eyes. Like everything got blurry. All of a sudden my brother was a triplet. It was amazing because they weren't made for me. And I didn't need glasses. And so... I was pretty proud that I didn't need glasses. Maybe I had one thing up on the old man, that my eyes were good and his eyes were bad, right? And so I went through school, and I watched my brother get glasses, and I made fun of my brother for getting glasses, and my mom had glasses, and I picked on mom for having glasses, and everybody had glasses. And in fifth, by the time I got to, like, fourth and fifth grade, every year they moved me a little closer to the board. I was like, what are they doing? I'm just such a good student. I'm so blessed and highly favored that they want me right here in front because they want to see my shining face every morning. I would say, Miss, Miss Teacher Man, that I don't remember any of my teacher's names. I'm here, and you get to look at the glory that is me. <laughs> Little did I know that they were recognizing that my eyesight was getting worse and worse and worse. And I can remember in fifth grade, we had this teacher, and she, was, she tortured us. And so she didn't give us notes. She came in early on the day of the notes, and we had two blackboards that were green. It's weird. And uh, she would handwrite all of the notes across all of those blackboards. Two of the four walls of the classroom were blackboards, and she'd handwrite in cursive all of the notes. And so that day's project was you sat down with your notebook, and you had to copy all of the notes onto your notebook and it would be checked by this teacher, and then once it was checked, then you could have some free time, right? So we were all like writing so fast our papers were catching on fire because we wanted to get to the free time. We just <laughs> couldn't read a thing I wrote. But I was writing it down as fast as I could, and I remember like I couldn't see the board. And I'm, I'm squinting and I'm struggling, and I've got this guy next to me and he's bumping me, right? He's left-handed, I'm right-handed. 
It's no, it's no good, right? His left hand's bumping me, my right hand's bumping him, and we're getting aggravated at each other. Long story short, because of my lack of eyesight, I was agitated, and I was frustrated, and I was losing time on my free time, and I knew the best snacks and treats went first, and if I was going to be at the end, I was going to get some, like, Tootsie Roll that I didn't want. I, was gonna, I wanted the good candy. And so we got aggravated at each other, and like you do in fifth grade, we decided that we're going to go out to the soccer field on our break, and we're going to fight, right? Because that's how you solve it. We're going to fight because I can't see. And so we went out on the soccer field. Long story short, we fought. I was winning. I know you were in no doubt that I was winning. I mean, I was winning. And then he stuck his big foot out, and I tripped over it, and I fell on my shoulder, and my collarbone broke and set on top of itself. And then he won. The fight was over. Why do I say all that? Because of my poor vision, because of my lack of being able to see the board, I allowed my emotions and my reactions and everything to be tainted by that. I couldn't see what was right in front of me. If I had been able to see, all of this would have went away. My problem really wasn't that big. My problem was the lack of being able to see a board, but I thought my problem was Chad. Chad just was in the way. He wasn't really my problem, and if I could have seen my problems for what they were, if I could have recognized what they actually were, I would have only broken my collarbone two times in my life instead of three, but that's a whole another story for another time. But today, we have, life's, we have obstacles in each one of our lives. If I gave you all a microphone and passed it around, we'd be here all day. You're not going anywhere anyway. It's raining. And so we're here in God's house dry. It's amazing. And I could pass the microphone around, and each one of us could say, this is my obstacle in my life. This is what's holding me back. This is what's right there in front of me, and I can't get past it, and it is aggravating me, and it's stressing me out. It's causing anxiety. It's too big. But today, I want to tell you, you need to stop looking at your obstacles with your eyes and start looking at them through God's eyes. Because it's when we start looking through God's eyes at our obstacles that our obstacles don't seem to be as big as what we thought they were. And so we're going to be in 2 Kings 6 today, and we're going to read out a part of it here. We're going to read out of verses 13 through 23. Before we get there, I want to give you a little backstory on it. And so the Israelites were out. There's always somebody who doesn't like the Israelites. There's always somebody trying to take out God's people. And so the king of Aram has it out for him. And he decides, he's talking with his leaders at his base, where he's at, in his camp. And he decides, I'm going to go and I'm going to attack them at this point. It's their war room. They've got plans. They've got armies. They've got chariots. They've got horses. They've got everything they need. And they're coming to attack. And they show up to attack. And as soon as they show up to attack, the Israelites are there ready for them. And he's left scratching his head. What's, what's this about? How did you know? And so they make another plan, and they go out to do it again. And again, the Israelites are there Thwarting their, their, their goal, they can't take out the Israelites, they keep on getting stopped. And he can't understand, he gets so frustrated that he looks at his men and he says, who's the traitor? Who's giving information to them? Because there's no way that they know what I'm planning. There's no way anybody could have heard what my plan was to defeat them. One of his leaders Got a little bold. And he said, well, have you heard of the prophet? There's this man named Elijah. He's kind of a bad dude. Like, you don't really want to mess with him. But, like, Elijah, is, he hears from God. And his God speaks to him. And as he's praying, God's telling him exactly the words that you're speaking to us. And he's relaying them to his king so that his king can protect his people because they're God's chosen people. And so the king is furious, right? Now they have to devise a plan. How are we going to go get this guy? It's just one guy. 
right? Like, this should be an easy plan. It's one dude. Take out the one guy, and we're going to conquer him. And so he devises the plan. So we'll start reading here in verse 13, and then we'll talk about it here a little bit. It says, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. One guy. Chariots and horses and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. As the enemy came down towards him, Elijah prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elijah had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the men you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and they were inside Samaria. Where the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and go back to the master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. So there's a lot of stuff that happens here. My favorite verse is where he goes all Jedi master and he's like, these are not the people you were looking for. It's my favorite. Just had to put it in there. Um, but the king, the king of Aram had a solution for his problem. He said, this is one guy. This is just one man. I know he prays and I know his God does some great things, but it's one guy. I have chariots and horses and armies, and I'm going to gather them all up, and we're going to take him out and anybody who tries to stop us on the way. I'm stronger than he is. I can take him out. It's interesting that he sends a big army. We don't know the exact number. It could have been thousands of people that he sent to go attack Elisha. But you got to think back to, to Elijah, the, the man that he served before Elijah. He was just up on the mountaintop and praying. And the king sent for him and sent with a, a commander and 50 men and said, you need to come and speak to the king. And Elijah said, well, if God wants me to come, if he, you know, I'll come. But if not, you guys can all burn. Gone. And then they sent 50 men again and a commander. Same answer. Gone. And so I'm thinking that the king probably heard this story and said, maybe 50 is not enough. It's one dude, but this is a bad dude. We're going to send everybody. Like, we're bringing everybody out. Even grandma's going. She's bringing her cast iron skillet. We don't care. Do what you got to do. We're taking him out. Everybody go. It's not optional. But his problem was... He only had what power he had. He only had what he could see. His eyes could only see the men and the chariots and the horses, which are terrifying. If I wake up in camp and see the men and the chariots and the, and the horses all surrounding me, there's going to be a moment of fright. There's going to be a moment of panic. But he couldn't see what he couldn't see. And so he came and he tried to fight, and we see that, that Elijah's servant lives in that moment that probably most of us would, and he was terrified. I mean, he's like, Elisha, what are we going to do? Like, this is bad. Where do you want to die? Because it's happening. Like, we're going down. You have to understand, his servant was young. His servant, theoretically, was brand new, because if you flip over a chapter in 2 Kings, you see where, where he had prayed for Naaman and sent Naaman down to the river to dip and to be healed of his leprosy. And when Naaman tried to, to pay him, he said, no, I don't want any payment. 
go about your way. And as he went, I can't remember the name of the servant, but his old servant decided, oh, I'm going to get me some. Like, I'm going to get some payment. Like, my master just took care of that man was leprosy, and now he's clean. We're getting something. And so he ran after him and got something. And when he came back, what did, what did Elisha say to him? You're deceitful. And now his leprosy will be on you. And he went away. He turned the page over, and we're here in chapter 6. This is a brand new servant. He doesn't have the benefit of seeing all of the stuff that, that, that Elijah had experienced. That's some great stuff. We get the retrospect. We get to read the book. We know. But he doesn't know. He may have heard some stories, but he's not seen it. And so he's afraid because he can only see, like the king of Aram, what's in front of him. Elijah had trained him to get up early in the morning and to go out to the people and check the camp and theoretically pray and just make sure things are good. And his morning was wrecked because there's soldiers everywhere around the camp. I'd be afraid too. You know, there's been times where we've all walked in that, in that fear. You know, that fear that can grip you when you look at it just with your own eyes. You know, there's times where I've looked at my bank account and the cold sweats start to come because, you know, sometimes the bank account, it's like you no longer have a bank account. Like, why are you checking here? We have nothing for you, right? And it's not a good feeling. You know, those have been moments in our lives. God's been gracious to us and, and gotten us through. But those moments for a second, there's some panic, you know, whatever that thing is, whatever that obstacle, whatever that mountain is, when you're staring at it dead in the face, it's not a good feeling. I can, I, can feel the, I can feel the moment that this servant's feeling. I can feel those cold sweats and the panic and the where are we going to go? Is there a tunnel? Did we dig a tunnel? If I could have a tunnel, I just want a tunnel to get out of here. Like something, but there was seemingly no escape. And so he goes to his master, and his master is gracious. His master doesn't cut him down. He doesn't say, you have little faith. He doesn't, like, do any of that in this moment because it wasn't the moment for that. There's moments for that. This wasn't the moment for that. And so Elisha looks at him, and he says, we vastly outnumber the troops that are coming for us. I can see the confusion on his servant's face. Like, I know you're kind of getting old, but, like, there ain't a lot of us. Like, look around, like, there's more of them. And Elijah pauses and says, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And he opens his eyes, and then he sees God's army. What a sight. Like, I've not seen it, but I can't imagine what that looked like. Their little horses probably look like little ponies. They're like my little pony versus, like, the, like, warriors of, like, whatever coming at it. I'm like... Like, it, it probably looked like nothing. And this servant's probably like, yeah, come and get some. I got faith now. You can take it. Get him. He's right here. He's right, not me. He, he's right here. Come and get him. It's amazing. Because he saw through God's eyes for a moment. He saw what nobody else could see. He saw what the king didn't see, or the king wouldn't have wasted his army to send them there because he was sending them to their death, most likely. The clearer our sight of the power of heaven is, the less we fear the things of this earth. The clearer the sight of the power of heaven, the less we fear the things of this earth. Because I've seen some powerful things here on the earth. And we got the opportunity to go to Bush Gardens while we were on uh, our National Fine Arts trip and vacation. And, and I've seen, I see some big animals there. They got some big old rhinos. They got some elephants. And those things are beasts. I mean, if they want to kill me, it's over. Lions and tigers, no bears. Oh, my. But they had them all there. And all those animals can destroy me so quick. But their power compared to God's power is nothing. Those tigers are kittens. They're nothing. But we can't see it. We can't always see it. And so the powerful army's fate quickly flipped here. Elijah's not done praying for sight. He prays for sight again. And he looks to God and he says, 
Lord, blind them. Blind that army. And he does. And then he does Jedi mind tricks. He says, this is not the man you are looking for. This is not the place you are looking for. Let me show you where you're looking for, right? And he takes them into Samaria. But as I was studying this, scholars believe that the words that were written here, some scholars believe that the words that were written here where it says they were blinded, it's not necessarily blinded to not being able to see anything. Not blinded where you shut your eyes and you can't see anything. You've got a mask over like it's just darkness. But blinded to where they couldn't see figures. They couldn't see things in front of them. They could just see light. And so, you know, even, even now in this room, if you shut your eyes and look around, you can tell when you're looking at one of the pendant lights and when you're not because that light kind of comes through your eyelid a little bit. And so they believe that their, their sight was more blurred and reduced to where they just see light. I remember when Sunshine and I were serving in, at Freedom Worship Center in Galliano, Louisiana, uh, 12 years ago, and attorney was just a baby. We just had one kid. We were a normal family. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was working at the church, and I had gotten to this habit of where I didn't wear my glasses much. I didn't like to wear the glasses, and so I'd wear contacts a lot. And I began to wear my contacts all day, all night, all day, all night, for weeks, sometimes months on end. And it was great because I was like, who needs LASIK? I just pop these little plastic things in my eyes and I'm good. And then I'll just pop them out and I'll replace them. And one day my eyes started hurting, like pretty bad, to the point where like, I couldn't really open my eye the whole way. And you like, if, you, if you've worn contacts and you've gotten something in there, like, it's bad. And, like, the pain is, like, not here. It's, like, in the back of my head. And it's, like, going through. Like, it's bad. And so as a man, I decided to get in my car and drive myself to the eye doctor. Because I can't see. Right? That's the right thing to do. It's what we all do. It's okay. I got there. I didn't wreck the car. And so I get there, and I walk in, and I'm looking at the optometrist. And he's like, what do you need? I'm like, my eyes aren't working. Like, I don't know. And so he, he gets in there, he, he does whatever he does, and he scrapes on stuff, and he pokes at stuff, and he puts drops in stuff, and all of a sudden I can see even less. Like, this guy destroyed me, and I was like, getting ready to walk out, I'm like, I'm going to drive home. And at this point, like, I can't open my eyes. All I can see is every light, it's like they turned up the wattage. Like, everything was incredibly bright. I couldn't see anything. And you know it was bad because I called Sunshine and said, come pick me up. It got bad. Like, I couldn't even drive. And she took me home. And, and long story short, I ended up being okay after a day or so. Everything, you know, worked out. There was an infection in the eye, and they gave me some, some good medicine and all that. So don't wear your contacts overnight. Just take them out, clean them. It's okay. But seeing like that, I imagine that's what this army saw like. I imagine all of a sudden they could see great, and then it was gone. And they're, and they're just kind of fumbling around and trying to... To, to find somebody and, and their trusted people that took them to where they were at couldn't see either. And so they needed a new guide. They needed somebody to, to take them where they were at. And for whatever reason, they looked to Elijah, who was the guy they were looking for. And he took them in and, and he walked them to, the, to Samaria and, and they were surrounded by the Israelites. And he says, give them their eyes back. Can you imagine their faces? Like, they were just winning. And now they're in the enemy's camp, surrounded by the enemy's soldiers. I think the panic and fear that was on that servant's eyes and face is probably on the army's face now. Because they've been the battle. They know what battle's about. They know what, what fighting is about. There's a winner and a loser. You don't want to be the loser. Losers don't tell stories. And the king of Israel says twice, if you look back at the verse, he says, can I kill him? Can I kill him? Twice. He's pretty excited. And Elijah shows mercy. And he says, his words basically say, we're going to show him mercy here. We're going we're to take pause. In fact, get him food and water. Some translations say, give them bread and water. Just give them some resources, basic resources. And the king at the time must have respected Elijah a lot because he did a feast 
a full feast for the army. They fed them, they ate with them, and they sent them about their way. And after they got back, there was no more fighting. There was no more attacks from them. But this end part, sometimes reading, I was talking to Pastor Shannon uh, last night, sometimes reading through some of these Old Testament stories, it's like, man, there's a lot of Jesus in this verse. But he's not there. But he's there. And I was reading, and I was thinking about how many times we get caught up in life. We get caught up in whatever these obstacles are, these mountains that are coming before us, these things that are insurmountable in our eyes, and, and, and we're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get strong, and I'm going to fight this, and I'm going to make it better. And, you know, you can use the financial example I'm going to go out and work another job, and I'm going to get another paycheck, and I'm going to pay those bills down, and I'm going to take care of all that, and that's all well and good, but not necessarily on your own. And we get caught in this trap of where we're fighting so hard in our own power to do everything, and I feel like sometimes I have a cheerleader on my shoulder saying, yeah, that's the right thing to do. It's very well the enemy just telling me, yeah. Keep on working hard. Keep on putting your hand to that plow. Keep on plowing that, that ground that's not, not fertile, not, not producing any fruit. Work there. Work, don't work that. Work over here. Stay away from that good stuff. Work hard over here. And then when desperation sets in, the bottom falls out. And we're left there standing there holding nothing, broken, desperate, on our own, tired, grumpy, all of these things. And the one standing there is Jesus. Saying, what you want to eat? Come and eat with me. I got you. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm not going to take you out. Come and eat. Get strong. Let me show you the right way. Let me show you love and mercy. I I would, this army, this army had never been shown this level of compassion and mercy in their lifetime. God's all up in that moment. I mean, we're talking about revival with our conference coming up. Like, this is revival. I believe there's army, there's people in that army that didn't want to go back to their king. They wanted to stay right where they're at. They had found a home. But how quick does the enemy blind our eyes? And we think we're seeing clearly. And we think we're seeing everything in front of us, but we don't. And even in that moment when we're broken and, and we have nothing and, 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 and Christ is there offering himself, the enemy's just there cowering alongside of us and saying, no, 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 don't choose that. Come, 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 come with me. Come, come, come back up, back up, back up. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's get out of here. And I'm scared to believe that there's been times where I'm like, yeah, let's, let's get out of here. And I follow him. Because I still can't see. Because the man standing in front of me is just one broken man. He's got scars in his hands. He's got a crown of thrones and he's standing there in front of me. I'm like, why, why would I choose that? Because I can't really see. My eyes aren't really open. We have to have that hope in Jesus. Our hope is Jesus. And that faith in what's happening. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, and 9 says, but since we, belong, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 27 says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery, which is in Christ you, the hope of glory. In Matthew 17, 20, it says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So I used the illustration of my dad picking up a gallon of milk as a kid and how that was really a feat for me. I mean, like, 
is a big deal. And I think everybody in this room has either babysat, watched kids, had their own kids, taken care of a younger sibling before. And there's, there's not quite the disaster like when a kid thinks that they're grown and they go to get that big gallon of milk or that gallon of apple juice and they want to get themselves a drink and, and they've climbed up on the cupboards, they've not gotten a concussion, they didn't fall off the, they, 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 they climbed Mount Everest, they got their cup, they've come down and they've set that cup right in front of the refrigerator. Now the refrigerator door is swung wide open, electricity bill is just going and going and going, I'm a dad. And they're sitting there with that gallon of milk, and they unscrew it, and they're just over top it. I mean, they're just really bracing, and they pick it up, and go, 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 and it's all over the floor. And that's when you walk in. You don't walk in before. You walk in right as the thing flips over, and it's everywhere. And it's aggravating. And that, and that, that part of that apple juice is still under your refrigerator. I'm just letting you know. It's black and sticky and gross. It's there. Pull your refrigerators out this evening and clean them, everybody. We're cleaning our refrigerators today. But if they would come and ask mom and dad, we can be the hero. Because I can, I can unscrew it with two fingers. I can take just, just my finger and my thumb, and I can pour that whole glass of milk and not spill a drop. I can do it. I'm a dad. We can do it. But to our, our little kids, the little children, it's an impossible task. It's Herculean to be able to get it all in there without spilling some. And, and, and the worst is when they get just old enough that they pour it in and they think they've got victory. And as they go to pull it away, they clip the glass and the glass falls over. And it's like, <laughs> you were so close. I mean, you're right there. You stumbled at the finish line. And I still got to clean up, spill drink. an obstacle for them. They, they, they have to do it. But you know what? If they stop looking at those obstacles with their eyes, stop looking at our mountains with our eyes, we change our prescription. We start looking at them through God's eyes. We take off that old prescription. And we put on what's new. And we wear the appropriate eyewear. I know that the red doesn't go with blue. Nobody tell me later. I understand. <laughs> but when we put his prescription on, when we start viewing all of these troubles and these problems and these obstacles through his eyes, all of a sudden, they're not a big deal. He can pour you a glass of milk. You don't have to pour it yourself. You have to ask him, though. You got to be a part of the process. He's not going to just do it for you. So what's your mountain today? What's your mountain today? What's your obstacle? What's in your way? What is so big that you can't see past it and it seems like nothing can change it? What's your mountain today? What do you need him to move? There's two things we're going to open the altars for here in just a moment. And I don't know if the worship team's prepared. If they want to come and play something, that'd be great. That verse is, is, is preached and taught a lot. That faith like a mustard seed will move a mountain. We get it. Everybody's taught it in kids' church. We, we understand. Some days I don't have faith like a mustard seed. Some days I, don't, I, 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 I struggle to have any faith. Because some days... Life is just tough. But you know what? Some days I can come in the office, I don't have faith, I can talk to Pastor Joe, and he's like, you can have my faith. I got faith for that situation. It's too big for you in the moment, but why are we sitting here in this auditorium every Sunday coming together? Because I might need your faith today. I might need to borrow a little bit of it. And you know what? Mine might be built up, and you might need to borrow a little mine in a couple weeks. And that's okay. But you got to know what your mountain is. 
you got to see that mountain for what it is. got to start looking through God's eyes and understand that we serve a Savior. We serve a God that's bigger than any of these obstacles in our lives. It won't move until you believe that. It won't move until you believe that. But the other, the other thing I want to look at is, you know, faith, faith's not just enough. I want, I want to have hope. And my hope is in Jesus Christ. And without that hope in Christ, I think it's really hard to have the faith. Because our hope is what's coming. Our faith sees what's here. And I want both in my life. And so we're going to pray here in a moment. And as I open the altars, I want our altar team to be able to come and be ready to receive any that are coming. But I believe that there's those of you in this auditorium today that need that hope in Jesus Christ. And maybe you've heard about him, maybe you've been taught about him, but he's not become real in your life. You have the opportunity today. You're going to have to get out your seat. You're going to have to come to the altar. You're going to have to talk to somebody and say, I want that. I want Jesus in my life. And our team is more than prepared and more than willing to pray with you. And as you pray and you accept Christ, your faith is going to start to build. But I know that there's many of us here today that may not even have the faith to face what we got the rest of our day. That we got big stuff on our docket the rest of the day. Service was awesome this morning. I'm so glad I was in here. I miss my kids next door, but man, God's doing something. And I love coming into God's house and being able to worship Him and being able to be challenged by His Word. But if you don't have the faith to face your mountain, you don't have the faith to face that obstacle that's in front of you right now, it seems too big. I'm going to invite you to the altar tonight, to, 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 today too. We want to pray with you. We want to pray that your prescription changes. That you stop looking at those problems through your own eyes, through your own power, through your own strength. Look, I'll save you the time and trouble. You're going to fail in your own strength. Why bother? Allow God to walk with you and allow Him to see you to see through His eyes. Just like that servant. Man, God, if there's somebody in this place that needs to see your army, let them see their army today. Let them write a book. I want to read it. There's a lot of us here today. Man, what's it look like in the spiritual right now? What angels are around us? What, 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 what battles going on in that parking lot to keep out things that we don't even know? It's here. It's here. And it's our fathers. We have full access to it. I don't want to walk in fear. I always loved Elijah. Dude's a bold dude. I want to walk like him. Elijah and Elisha. Two of my favorite characters in the Bible. Some bad dudes. I want people to look at us like that. When you go into your community, when you go to your job, when you go to your school, what do they see? So I'm going to pray, and as I, as I close the prayer, as I say amen, altar team, you can make your way to the front as I begin prayer. Everybody who needs to come, I want you all to come. We'll stay as late as we need to. Pray for everybody. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, we thank you for all that you are. Lord, that you are a God that's constantly battling on our behalf. Lord, that we don't see the wars that wage on, Lord. Lord, the fears, the anxiety, Lord, the obstacles, the the troubles that come our way, Lord. Lord, they seem insurmountable, Lord God, but you look at them and they're nothing more than pouring a glass of milk for a child. Lord, that you have full control and ability to be able to break through these things, Lord. That you have a a promise, Lord God, a hope, Lord, that's beyond that. Lord, today we pray that hope would be restored, Lord God. Lord, that that those that that have not known your son, Jesus Christ, would run to this altar, Lord. Lord, that they would come and they would want your hope, Lord. That they would run to your altar to meet your son, Jesus, today. To accept him for their life and their eternity to be changed forever, Lord. And for the rest of those, Lord, that need a little more faith today. Lord, that they would come. Lord, that they would come in agreement. 
Lord, that they would pray. Lord, that you would begin to pull their old glasses off and put that new prescription on, that they would be able to see with your eyes. Lord, that their problems begin to shrink. Lord, that they begin to step forward, Lord, boldly. Lord, that we begin to take that ground that the enemy took from us, Lord, that we gave to him. Lord, that it's no longer his. Lord, that he finds himself encircled by your great army, Lord God. And he has to bow his knee. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray all this in your blessed holy name. Amen. Come now.